Okay, so let me try not to forget this. Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Because yesterday I was told that I didn't speak loud enough or the, the sound wasn't loud enough. Um, all right, so let's, let's start where we left. Remind you, we, last time I told you about a bound on the detection of concentrations. All right, and so one thing you could ask yourself is if you look at this bound and you, you, you do the math, uh, can a bacterium actually sense a, a concentration gradient, okay? So let, let's put the, the concentration we had. So we'll do a numerical replication. So what we know also is that uh, bacteria, they tend to make the, the decision on the order of a second, right? So the, that's their reaction time of the order of a second. So I can put, it, put in all these numbers, and if I, if I do this, uh, I've 10 to minus 6, and I have And I have one. So let me see if I can do this right. This is really an order of magnitude, right? So again, this is really the best anybody can do, not just the bacterium. This is the physical limit. You can't beat that. And so if you put in the numbers with the size of a bacterium, you get that the, the, the best accuracy you could get is 5% in the estimate of the concentration. But remember, the bacterium, what it cares about is the gradient of, of uh, concentration. So one thing you could ask yourself is, how does it do that? How does it estimate the gradient? Do, do, you, know, do you have any idea of how it, could, uh, how it should do it? Yes? OK, OK, but it, it's a measurement device, right? So how does it know what this direction is? It, or it can, the, the, the sort of estimates I've been making now is just to estimate what the concentration is. How do you estimate what the gradient is? The gradient is, is a spatial gradient, right? So it wants to know where it's better and where it's worse. Right? So how does it do that? OK, so that, that's the right answer. It does it as it moves. Now, it's not obvious it should be the, that way, because in fact, that's what bacteria do. But uh, eukaryotic cells, such as amoebas or the neutrophil I was showing you in the movie uh, yesterday, uh, 
these, they don't, they don't do that. What they do is that they, they're a big cell, and they, they'll estimate the concentration here, and they'll estimate the concentration there, right? And then actually make some sort of a difference between the two. So they, they'll make a spatial difference between front and back, for instance. And if, if it's larger here, then you know, it will start moving in this direction. If it's larger there, it's going to move in that direction. That's so, for most eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotes, uh, just to, I mean, eukaryote is anything that's not a bacterium, essentially, right? There's also archaea, which is also close to, to bacteria, but uh, we eukaryotic uh, organisms, but yeast is also eukaryotic. So anything that's, you know, there's a, it's a difference of scale, right? Because what, what happens, in fact, uh, that's important because the bacterium, that's not what it does. And you see why from this estimate, right? Like you have, the bacterium is about one micron across, right? And it can only detect differences up to 5%, okay? So what it means is that it cannot, it, you know, if it were to measure what's in the front and what's in the back and make the difference, then this difference could be no larger than 5%, right? So if you get 5% decrease here, at most, that means that your gradient, the scale of your gradient, is over 20 times the size of the cell, at most, right? So, So what this means is that the, if, if, so it's not what it's doing, right? But if the bacterium was trying, yeah, if the bacterium was trying to detect spatial gradient by making a difference between front and back, then it could not detect gradients that are larger than 20 microns, right? So it would be very, very sharp gradients on, on very, very short scales. Now, in the experiment I showed you, for instance, but there are many other examples, you, you, can, you can see that the, the, the scale here of the gradient is more of the order of the millimeter, right? So these are sh fairly shallow gradients at least for the, from, the, from the bacterium perspective, the bacterium is one micrometer across. A gradient of a millimeter is like a thousand times its size. So it needs to be able to detect these this very small differences, very small relative differences of the order of uh, you know, one in a thousand. And the best it can do is 5%. Okay. So that means that it, it, it cannot use this strategy. So the, the, the strategy actually uses is the one uh, that uh, somebody said, and it's, it's using a, a run and tumble strategy. So the, the, way, the way the bacteria will, will, will sense the gradient is by moving, right? So it, it will, let's say you have the gradient. The bacterium will go forward, and instead of making a spatial gradients, it will calculate temporal gradients. So what, it, what the bacterium is asking itself as it's going forward, so the bacteria swim uh, using uh, some flagella, which um, I'll show you in a second. And when they swim, they swim more or less straight, okay? And as they swim, they ask themselves, I mean, they measure the concentration, and they measure the concentration differences in time. And as they do that, they ask themselves, is life getting better, right? 
do I see more of the ligands I'm interested in, or do I see less? Okay. If, if they see more and more, means that things are getting better, well, you know, if things are, getting, are, going, are going good, what should you do? Should you change direction, or should you continue what you're doing? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this is not a hard question. You should continue what you're doing, right? If things are getting are, are good, you continue. And if things are getting bad, so you see that you're going in the wrong direction because basically the, the concentration is decreasing from your point of view, then what you, should you do? Change. You should change direction, okay? So the bacteria, E. coli in particular, but many others do as well, have a mechanism such that when they sense that things are getting worse, they will randomly change direction. So they stop running. So it, it will be done by changing the direction of, one, of a few of their motors. And when they do that, they, they, they so-called, uh, they will uh, tumble, which means that they, you know, randomly reorient. So you can see that on, on, the, on that movie, which I'm, uh, on that movie uh, here, on the right side. So this movie uh, is not working, but you can see, if it were, you would see moving bacteria. Here, what they did is that the fluorescent, fluorescent fluorescently labeled the flagella of these bacteria, and so you can see them swim in, in uh, okay. So you can see here, like each of these are bacterium, and you see the flagellum. And every once in a while, like here, you see, like here, the flagellum, the, the, yeah, the, each bacterium has a, a few flagella. When they all spin in the same direction, it's going straight. But when a few of them change direction, then, uh, the bundle that the flagella form uh, un unwinds, and then it starts tumbling, meaning that it's doing a random reorientation. And so people have been studying this, uh, in, you know, biophysicists have been studying this with, with great accuracy because you can, you can actually measure many things about this behavior. And in particular, you can show that the, the, the length of each of the episodes of running versus tumbling are you know, very precisely exponentially distributed. This is experiments from the 70s. But you can show, uh, and these are you know, more recent experiments where they, they track uh, many, many bacteria at the same time. You can, you can also show that there's a bias towards the gradient. So this is exactly what I was saying. Like here, this is, a, this is the, the mean run length. So this is how long it stays in the run, running mode uh, as a function of direction. And here, the, the gradient is in this direction. So the bacteria actually want to go that way. And you can see here that when they are in this uh, area of the angles, they do longer runs. So when things are good, they tend to stay longer in that direction. And when uh, things are getting worse, they do much smaller runs. There's a factor two between the two on average. But they, they're all exponentially distributed. And so you, 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 can, you can basically summarize this behavior by what you may want to call a response function of the bacterium, and the response function will be uh, the probability that the bacterium will find itself in either of the two states of the model, right? So there are two states. One, it's called, uh, so this is the run and tumble thing, right? It goes like this. This is a run, and here you have the tumble when you reorient. And the point is that you know when when it gets good, it does longer run, so it will go in general. So to simplify, uh, these two modes correspond to two states of the model. One is called uh, counterclockwise because it's the direction of rotation of the model, and this is more or less equivalent to the runs. And this one is clockwise, and this corresponds more or less to the tumbles. OK? And so you can, you can characterize the response by the probability to be in the counterclockwise uh, or let's say, to be consistent to be in a clockwise regime, right? That would be your response. 
So among the experiments that people have done, they've been trying to characterize this response here as a function of what hap uh, as a function as of of uh, what the bacterium actually sees. Okay. So, so to do this, they, instead of uh, doing these kind of experiments where they these are freely running uh, bacteria, what they did is that they they stuck. Well, okay, there are several experiments, but they stuck the bacterium to a glass slide, and then they attached a gold bead uh, to or a polystyrene bead to the to one of the flagella, and then they observe the bead. If the flagellum is spinning in one direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, they will just be able to record that uh, that speed, and so that way you can see in, in what fraction of the time the bacterium is in either of these two states. Okay, and this is the kind of uh, data that they collect, and this is a somewhat old experiment from the 80s. Here, what they did is that they really wanted to characterize the response. Uh, in a, okay, what they wanted is some sort of the Green's function of the response. Okay, so what, what the idea is that you have some sort of linear response theory, and in this linear response theory, that what you you think is that this response would depend on the past experience. Of the concentration, sorry, of the past concentration experienced by the bacterium as it moves. Okay, so here it's actually not moving, but what you can do is that you can control its environment to change the concentration it's seeing. Right? So you have some concentration C of ligands here. This guy has receptor, so that you can sense, and you can change that. And uh, the assumption is that. In the linear response theory, this response will depend, by definition, you linearize the response linearly on, in fact, it's the log. It doesn't really matter. It's because uh, it, it will be sensitive to the log of the concentration, not the concentration itself. But it's linear in the log, OK? So you can view this as Green's function. It's the propagator, if you like, whatever. Or the or gain function. May, there are many ways of calling it. And here you integrate from minus infinity to t. So what this means is that you integrate the past of the concentration with some kernel or Green's function. Okay. And how do you measure this guy here? Well, there's a simple way of doing it, which is to, and it's something that's often done in physics, which is to, uh, to subject your bacterium to an impulse. Okay. So what you do is that you have your C, which you can control. And the way you will control it is that you'll add an impulse. Okay? An impulse, in mathematical language, is just a delta function. <coughs> I shouldn't call that delta C. That big K doesn't matter. So if you plug that into this, you'll see that your response will be equal to R0 plus g of t minus t0. Well, let's say it's a constant here. I mean, it's not necessarily. Yes, no, sure. Yes, sorry. Uh, I, I'll try and stop writing in the bottom. I, I tend to forget. Okay, so if you 
if you plug in an impulse, then what you get essentially, and that you probably know from linear response theory, you actually get uh, the, the response kernel up to a constant. And this is exactly the experiment they did here. If you had five seconds, they added this impulse, and you can see this response. So if you look at this, and I tell you this is, a, this is the, res the response kernel, what does that tell you about what the response does, what the, what the bacterium does? If you just inspect it, what do you think it does? Anybody? I mean, you know there's something about this function, right, which has, it becomes positive and then negative. Why do you think that is? What, what did I tell you the, the bacterium really cares about? It cares about the gradient, so it, it cares about making differences, okay? Do you see a, this, why this is a difference? Why is it a difference? Right. But exactly right. But the, the the point is that when you look at this, this is like you make an average of the past, right? With some kernel. What well, what this tells you is that first you have a positive lobe. So the positive lobe is taking an average over the very recent past of the concentration. Okay? So if there was no negative lobe, that would be it. That the response would just be a smoothing, if you like, of the past concentration. But you do have this negative lobe. So what is it doing? It's taking an average of the recent past, but then it's subtracting from that an average of something that's a bit more in, into the past. Okay, so what, what happens when you take an when you you take the value of something a little bit in the past and you subtract from it some, the value of the same thing a little bit more in the past? What happens when you make a difference? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> this is not a difficult question. Maybe you don't see what I'm getting at. Come again? Yes, if what happens if you make the difference between almost now and almost, you know, a little bit in the past? How do you call that? I, I write it down for you and you see why it's easy. So I, I'm simplifying, right? But the idea of, is that this response it would be like C of t a little bit in the past, so let's call it, you know, delta t minus, and so there's some, there's some constant here. I call it alpha. Minus the value a little bit more in the past. What does that give you? when that that is small. It's a derivative, okay? But, okay, next time you see this, you should immediately say, derivative, this is what this function does, right? It's taking a derivative. And it's taking a derivative because, in fact, if you do, you can maybe see it by i, but if you take the, the area in this positive lobe and you look at the area in the negative lobe, they're exactly equal to each other. So one exactly compensates the other. So it responds almost exactly to the, deri the derivative. But remember, this is what we want, right? This is what we want the bacterium to do. Because the bacterium only cares about things, whether things are getting better or whether they're getting worse. They don't care about the absolute value of the concentration, but this really shows it. There are more exp recent experiments based on, on uh, tracking 
So this was based on the behavior of the model. Then you can also do it d directly at the level of uh, runs and tumbles. And uh, this is a recent experiment uh, by the group of uh, Massimo Vergasola. And you can find almost exactly the same result. Uh, positive lobe, negative lobe. Another way uh, of checking uh, that, uh, that things are so, so okay, so, so the, the fact that the positive lobe and the negative lobe are, are balance each other exactly, this is what people call adaptation. They call it perfect adaptation. So why is it perfect adaptation? It's because you can see from this response that if you put a, a constant C, right? So let's see now that let, let's assume that C is constant now. If C is constant, these two term, terms would cancel out, right? So the response, if C is constant, the response is always the same no matter what C is, okay? So what that means is that, now it, let's say instead of putting an impulse, and now you, let's say you put this for concentration. You put some sort of a step function. What do you think will happen? Can you predict what the, what the response should be? Put it under it. A delta fun okay. Okay, I mean, it starts at R0, R right? And then what happens? We think it's a delta, okay, but it, everything is a bit smoothed out, right? I mean, it's not as clear as a, right? so what, it first go up, and then what, what happens? And it goes down, and it goes down to where? <laughs> to the same level, okay, exactly. So you can do this experiment, and this is what you get, okay? So it's working. It's adapting, right? So here what they did is that they actually changed the concentration. But at first it reacts, and then it goes back to this base, to basal level. It's always the same. So how does the bacteria do that, right? Because taking derivatives, how do you take derivatives? You know, if I ask you as an engineer, how would you take a derivative, how would you do it? Actually, I don't know the answer to that, but. I know, I know how E. coli does it, at least. I'm going to explain you know, very briefly to you and just do a very simple calculation to show you how it does it. And in, in the problem set, uh, you see there's, an, there's a problem, which is assuming that uh, it's sensitive to concentration in, in the way I explained. It, a, the, the problem is about showing how this actually allows the bacterium to move in the direction of the gradient, right, by calculating the mean drift of the bacterium doing this run and tumble strategy. But how, it, how does it do it? Uh, well, yes, sorry, question. How does it do it? Well, it's, it's quite complex. Uh, there's a network, so, but, but basically it starts let me just give you the, the broad picture. Right? What happens is that there are receptors at the surface of, of the protein which are sensitive to the ligands, uh, which are the chemoattractors. Okay? So this is what we've been talking about from the beginning. The bacteria have some receptors on the surfaces. This, these receptors will bind the, the chemoattractants. And based on this uh, binding, they, they will know something about the, the external concentration. Now, the, these receptors bind the ligands, and when they bound, uh, in fact, it, it's the opposite of what you would think. They, they become inactive. They tend to become inactive. And uh, so, so it's like a negative inference. And when it's active, it's actually then activating some, uh, some signaling pathway that then controls the model. Okay? So you, you can see this directly. The more ligands there are, uh, it would tune up some, some the concentration of some uh, of some molecule of some protein species inside uh, the, the cell, which itself will control the activity of the model, and, and namely the activity of the model, meaning whether it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay. So in the simplest thing, you could say that the response 
of the mother is proportional to the probability sorry so I, I said when the when the receptors are bound they become inactive so the response is about the activity of the motor so it's like a repression and that you saw uh, with Alexandra it would be something like this okay in fact you saw also maybe with Alexandra there's a possibility of having a cooperation between receptors it's called the, the you know a hail function so you put this to the power L but it doesn't really matter for our purpose really what's important is that the response is a is a decreasing function of the activity sorry the response is a decreasing function of the concentration but if it did just that if that was the response and there was nothing else would the bacterium take the derivative I mean the answer is no right obviously then it the response you see here does really depend on the absolute concentration So the way it works is that, in fact, there's something that's called integral feedback, which is that the KD of the receptors can itself be modified as a function of the activity. And the way it works is the following. There's some, you don't need to remember The receptors can be modified by ad adding some methyl groups to the receptors. Methyl groups are like CH3 here. And these me methyl groups can be added by two uh, enzymes. And they can only be added from, to the active sites and removed from the inactive sites. So because of that, to make a long story short, this methyl me methylation level you can show follows this sort of equation. Okay? So basically, the evolution of the methylation level will depend on the activity itself. Okay? I'm not going to, into the mechanism, but this is really the, the, the one thing you need to, to, to remember. And then you see that this methylation level will change the KD. Right? So there's some sort of a feedback. Like if you like, you have the concentration of the ligands here. right? And this goes, you know, you have activity, which is basically the level of uh, these messenger proteins inside the, 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 the cell. And here you have the motor that controls the flagellum. Okay? So what I wrote here is just this part. That's the activation part. And uh, great. now you have, the, you have this part, which is the feedback. This activity will feedback negatively on the receptors. And this is called. So this is, a, this is a very simple network. You just have you know, two nodes and just a repression. And it's called integral feedback because you can see that M, which is what mediates this repression here, uh, essentially is proportional to the integral of the activity, right? Because it's because of this equation. So how does that help me achieve adaptation? So remember, adaptation. If you think about it, like really, what we mean by it adapts, meaning that if you change the concentration level, there will be there will be some response, and then we we'll adapt back to the basal response. This is what we said, and this, is, was, this was the result of that experiment. Right? No matter what you do, then if you keep a constant concentration, it should always come back to the same level. 
But you see from this equation, if you want to solve this at steady state, so C equals constant, so you put your bacterium in at constant concentration, and then you know, sim look at these equations. Steady state means that this is 0. So steady state, constant response, just by virtue of this. It's the motor response. So, so it's what I call. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's like. It's it's more or less the probability of being clockwise. No, no. I mean, in this one. Yes, right. Okay, sorry. Uh, there are different conventions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, okay, so it, 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 it's a good point. I always get this wrong, but I don't think you should worry about it too much. The, the point is that at the end of the day, we have many minus signs, and in the end, it should always be that if things get better, you should not turn, okay? So I think this is, this is what this is saying. So maybe I got it wrong last time. There was probability of being counterclockwise. But there are different conventions. Because I think here, I think here they actually looked at the probability of being uh, clockwise. So you have to be careful. But don't worry about the sign, OK? Let, let's agree not to worry about the sign. Well, OK. Um, why the logarithm? Yeah, you have to. Why not? I mean, I, I want to say it's linear. I can say it's linear, whatever I want. But if you want a motivation and you look at this, I, I'm going to expand on this a little bit, right? Ah, you can write it as this way. Right? So it's in my, in my logarithm. If I want to linearize it in, in the logarithm, you know, why not? What you see is that here, this KD, because of the way I wrote it, Maybe this, is, maybe this is the reason why, profoundly. Like here, I have log of c and I have m. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to linearize this. Look, I, I think the short answer is that you should take my word for it. Because they, they, there's, there's a reason why this is always the right uh, regime. But I don't want to go into too much into the detail of the biochemistry. So let's assume that I can do this linearization. And here my linearization would be the following. So here alpha and beta can be expressed as a function of my parameters here. And I still have my equation from before. 
So I, now I want to solve for this. For any, I want to solve for this for any uh, any function c of t. I want to know what's what's r of t. Um, So let me define delta r is equals r minus r naught. I'm going to do is I'm going to take its derivative. So it's the derivative of this function. I'll call that x of t. So that's my input. And then what I have is just Right, so I just replaced the MDT here. Okay, so you, you all know how to solve this. I want to solve this for delta r, right? So it's a it's a linear equation with a non-homogeneous term. I'll just write quickly how you do this. Okay, and uh, this is important. All right, so again, you can see that the response only depends on the derivative. And if, if you interpret this, you can see that this is basically taking uh, some sort of an average with an exponentially decaying kernel over the recent past of that derivative. Now, if you want to calculate the g we had before, right? Uh, you can do it. You just need to do an integration by parts. Sorry, I wrote uh, very low again. I hope you can see. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay? So my g, remember my g, that's my kernel function, is simply minus alpha a Dirac Okay, so this is what I want. What G is, is it takes the value now and subtract from it the value a little bit before. Right, so this is like a, a, an average. And so if you, if you plot this out, um, so then we run into the problem uh, you mentioned of the sign, right? So. Uh, if you if you take the you know the inverse of the response, so it then change the sign, you get that the response to a pulse is a delta function, and then you have uh, an exponential exponentially decaying negative lobe. So that's the delta function. That's the negative lobe. The, the width of the negative lobe here is about one of the beta gamma. Okay? So it's consistent with what we see experimentally. I remind you. First a big peak and then you know a negative lobe. So this is how bacteria take derivatives, using this integral feedback. Uh, in the homework, you see in the first uh, sheet, I think, of the homework, you, there's an example of another way of taking derivatives. OK, so just a last uh, no, few words again about um, experiments. So this was the. The experiment from the 80s where they, rec they, they looked at the response to a, a, an impulse. So more recently, people have been revisiting this idea, saying, OK, if they're really taking derivatives. And here, really, since I'm working in x space, which is log c, people wanted to know whether it's really true that it's taking, if you, if you like, logarithmic derivatives, meaning derivatives of log c. So what they did for that is that they, they assumed that w where they, 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 they had a, a system in which they could measure the activity. So they didn't measure the activity uh, by looking at the motto, the behavior. They looked directly at, some, um, at the molecular level, what happened inside these cells. And uh, they measured it, now not in response to an impulse or to a gate or to step function or whatever. They, they looked at the response to an exponential ramp, right? So they, they put some uh, exponential ramp of this form, right? Which is like saying that x is linear in time, right? And the idea is that if that's the case, then if we put this kind of stimulus, then the the response of the bacterium by by virtue of of, uh, of this should only depend on the on the rate r of the ramp. Okay, after some adaptation time, of course. So they looked for some sort of fake steady state. So it's not a real steady state, but they want to see where the re response stabilizes when they expose the bacteria to this ramp. And this is the re these are the results here. Here you see the in blue you see the exponential ramp of concentration, and C you see the response. So big in the beginning there's some adaptation, short adaptation, and then the response C say, stays at some slightly negative level. Right? So the, this response here is exactly my delta r. And if they put a, a bigger ramp, meaning with a larger r, then you see the response is larger. And you can calculate how the response depends on the, on the, on the rates of that ramp. And what this really shows is that the bacteria is, is really uh, sensitive to the exponential, to the logarithmic derivative of the concentration. Uh, you can go even further. You can do a Fourier analysis experimentally. 
So what you do is that now, instead of uh, putting exponential ramps or whatnot, um, you put o oscillatory stimulus. So you, you, you make this, the concentration oscillate. And then you look at the response. And once you have the response and the you know, input and the response, you can do a, a Bode diagram for the transfer function. So what is, what is the transfer function in, in Fourier space of uh, taking the derivative? If you take the derivative, put that into Fourier space, what does it mean? No? Come on. <laughs> you take the derivative. If in Fourier space, what does it mean to take the derivative? In physics, what do you do? Is it that people who know don't want to say it, and people who don't know don't want to say it? But <laughs> if you know it, just, just give me some hints, right? You take the derivative in Fourier space, what does it mean? Yes. Right. More precisely, you multiply it by i omega, right? Taking the derivative. You know that, right? I mean, I'm not. Come on. <laughs> so. This, is, this should be my G, right? This is the Fourier transform of my G. It should be proportional to I omega. This is just a Bode diagram of response function, right? So, so here you can calculate this, this, uh, this response, and you can see that unless you go to a very high frequencies, a fairly high frequencies, you do see a, a linear dependency of the function of, of frequency. And also, quite importantly, you see that the, the phase of this, so the angle of this, is actually uh, pi over 2, right? So the 1 half means pi over 2. So it's, it's another evidence that's really taking the derivative. Um, OK, I think we'll take a break now. It's a good time. And five minutes. After the break, we start talking about other things and chemotaxis. So now we've seen chemotaxis. And I just, I just uh, well, one of motivation was to look at this uh, physical bound on concentration detection, which was derived by Berg and Purcell. So let, let me go back to that problem, because there will be a motivation to look at uh, another example. And to see the, the link and the usefulness of maximum likelihood and, and uh, Bayesian thinking. So as I said, you know, I, I've been talking, when I talked about Berg and Purcell, I told you about a perfect idealized monitoring sphere that was measuring the concentrations. Now, in fact, uh, the ligands are really sensed by receptors. Okay. So the receptors, they bind the chemoattractors, and then the chemoattractors get unbound. And in the simplest approximation, you, you will have to admit that the, the, the rate of arrival of, uh, of new receptors, oh, sorry, of, of new ligands, Assuming that the receptor is perfect, will be equal to 4 dA. 
A is the dimension of my receptors. Of my receptor. You can actually show this more rigorously by assuming that my receptor is like on my surface of my cell is a perfect absorbing disk of radius A. Sorry, of diameter A. I'm not going to show it now, but this is something you can show. So the rate of binding depends on diffusion, of course. The, the faster diffuse, the more it, it's likely to, to hit the receptor. It also depends on the size A. The bigger the receptor, the more likely it is to actually bind the ligands. Okay? So this is the rate of binding. And then there's also, sometimes spontaneously, with some rate K off, it will unbind. So if you want to know what's the probability for the, the receptors to be bound, for instance, so if I look at any given time, what is the probability that my receptor has a ligand bound to it? Do you know the answer? Can you guess? All right. You can solve some sort of a simple master equation. Which is the following. The project of being bound as a function of time will evolve according to, the, to this equation. When it's unbound with priority 1 minus bound with the rate 4 dA times C, right? Because the rate of binding that's for a given molecule, but then you need to multiply by how many molecules there are. So here I should add the C, really. And then once it's bound with priority P bounds, it can get unbound with rate K off, okay? So if you solve this as steady state, you found that Following result. So now one can ask the same question as we asked for the perfect monitoring sphere, but now at the level of a single receptor. If you're asking about a single receptor, let's say my measurement device now is just the receptor. Of course, the cells are many receptors, so you can integrate for many receptors. But let's focus just for a moment on one receptor. And ask yourself, knowing the state of the receptor, how could I estimate the concentration? So it's, again, we want to know it's some sort of, you know, we can view it in a Bayesian way or in maximum likelihood way. The receptor, what it sees, it sees whether it's bound or not. That's all it sees, okay? But what the cell wants to know about is the concentration. Okay. So really, if you think about what the receptor sees or what the cell sees eventually, it's something like this. It's just the state of the receptor. So sometimes it's bound. Right, so then it takes value one, let's say, and it's a, what's so-called a telegraph process. It takes value zero and ones. And this is what you see, right? What you, want to, what you want to know, really, is the concentration. So if you see this kind of thing, 
and you want to estimate the concentration, what, what would you do? What would be your first guess? It's a fraction of time. Yeah, okay, very good. You said it's the fraction of time, it's because you have this formula, right? So if you say, okay, I look the fraction of time I was bound, so I look at, you know, I add this plus this plus this plus this, so, you know, I will call this T bound. And I take T bound over total time, right, of my observation. And I say, okay, this is about equal to probability of being bound. And you get this, okay? So that would be a, a good guess. You estimate how long, you know, how often you were bound, and then you you invert this relationship to get C. Okay? And in fact, this is what Berg and Purcell considered. So it's the same in the same paper that I talked about talking about the perfect monitoring sphere, but they also applied it to a single receptor. And what they found is, if you do this, so sorry, now I write. Uh, oh, sorry. What they found is the following result. I'm not going to do the calculation, but you can do it by calculating the fluctuations on the, the total time that was bound and see how it translates into fluctuations of C. But this is what they find. But in fact, now you can ask yourself, what if now I used, you know, to do this, I used some heuristic guess. And so far, you've seen that the heuristic guess, like taking the, frequent, the empirical frequency or this sort of thing, was usually the right thing to do in terms of maximum likelihood. It would give the same result as the maximum likelihood estimate. Here, however, it, it turns out not to be the case. If you do maximum likelihood, this is not the estimate you, you will end up, end up with. It's not completely obvious why, but let, let's, let's write it down explicitly. If you write down the probability of a given trace, so a given trace I'll write, it's like the entire trace, right? I write it this way, given C. Uh, so if I want to write this down, I'll just write that at each event of binding, I'll have a factor, I'll use maybe a different color, D for DAC. At each unbinding, I have a K off, right? So N is the number of binding events, right? But that's not it. There's, I also need to take into account the probability that nothing happens in this period. So here in this period, it didn't get unbound. So that go goes with probability and exponential minus k of this amount of time. So sorry about the heavy notation, but this will be T1 plus, this will be T1 minus, T2 plus, T2 minus, etc. Right? It's my the, the plus are just the binding events, the minus are the unbinding events. And here I just have 
It's the property that nothing happens during this time. I mean, there are no binding events during that time. What's geometric? The exponential? Yeah. It's because when I, I look at it, something that happens in a Poisson manner, like a Poisson uh, point process, the probability that it, you know that happens with rate k, the, the probability distribution for its time of arrival is equal to this. So, and you can interpret this that this is the rate that actually happens during delta t. So there's always a delta t here, right? But here I'm, I, I put proportion to forget about the delta t's, otherwise they won't matter at the end anyway. This is the priority of binding, and this is the priority of not having bound so far, right? So here I'm just putting all these factors here. At the end, it somewhat simplifies. I have my 4D AC K of to the power N. And here is basically, I'll just add up all the time it was. So this is the time it was unbound. <coughs> this is the time it was bound. And this is where I use maximum likelihood. Now I'll take the derivative of the logarithm of that monster with respect to C, and I set it to 0, right? And this will be, so all I need to care about is the terms that depend on C. So if I look, I just have the C here. So I just get the n logarithm of c. And here I just have 4 d a c t unbound. And what does it give me? Just give me c star is equal to n over 4 Just did algebra. I took the derivative. OK? But what you notice is that this was my estimate from Berg and Purcell. You see, it's quite different, actually. Here I use t bound and total t. Here I actually use the number of binding events and t unbound. So it's actually used different pieces of information. Of course, you know, t bound plus t unbound is equal to, to t, but clearly here I don't use the total number of binding events. Right? And here you do. But now, more interesting, let's look at the error. So the error, as I said, what, what you need to do is that you need to calculate. So th this is my, of course, this is my likelihood. So I call it L. I take the second, you know, I can, I can calculate the error I will make from the second 
derivative of the log likelihood. And this is also easy to do, the second derivative of this. I just get n over c squared. OK? I remember the error I will make, which is the difference between my estimate and the truth on average is equal to the inverse of that. So with the absolute value. So C two over N. Now I get something familiar again. My relative error is proportional to 1 over n number of binding events. You see, it keeps coming back, right? Like, you have n measurement. Your relative error is going to go like 1 over n. But what's interesting is that what's the error in, in terms of the physical parameters? n, the number of binding events, so to calculate the number of binding events, all you have to do is to look at the rate of binding and multiply it by the probability of being unbound, because you can only bind right. So that would be the effective rate of binding, and you multiply it by t. Sorry, actually, here I made a here I made a mistake. There's a four. Okay. So let me write the, rewrite this. Uh, one minus p bound t, and now my error goes like one over 4 <coughs> dAC 1 minus P bounds T. So that was Berg and Purcell. And now my maximum likelihood estimate is this. What's the difference between the two? There's a factor two, yes. But it's not a mistake. Usually when you get a factor two wrong, you have to do your calculation again a few times. But here it's actually not wrong. And there is a big difference between these two estimates. And let me just explain intuitively what the difference is. And it would be useful to understanding something really fundamental about vision, which I'll come to in a second. Basically, when you're looking at the, at the fraction of the time you're bound, you're adding two sources of uncertainty. One is, you have to wait to, between two binding events, right? This is a random variable, how much time you wait. And as we said, it's distributed exponentially in this way. So you have one source of uncertainty here. And this is really what depends on concentration, this binding event. And then when you look at the fraction of, of bound events, you also add another source of stochasticity, which is the time it remains bound. But the time it remains bound is also stochastic. It's, it's also distributed exponentially at this rate. But that has nothing to do with the concentration. 
So you add this new source of stochasticity to your estimate that's n that you didn't have to, right? So, and you can see it when you write the likelihood. This doesn't depend on concentration. When you take the derivative, it will just drop out, right? Same thing here. But when you do the estimate, when you ask how, how what's the fraction of the time it was bound, you do care about how long it stayed, right? And in fact, you shouldn't care. What you should really care about is how many times it bound in the time that it was actually allowed to bound, right? This is exactly what this is saying. How many times does it bound? Did it bound divided by uh, the the entire time where it could be bound? And so this is where this factor two comes from. So if you were to, if if biology were to solve this problem, because what what E. coli actually does. It does what Berg and Purcell suggested. E. coli, it does this sort of integration over the recent past of, of the activity of the receptor. So it has no way of actually removing the noise from the binding events. So there's the binding event. Whatever it's bound, it's going to suppress activity. And then it gets unbound. And the time it will remain bound is stochastic. And it, there's nothing you can do about it, right? But if it were to solve the problem, instead it would, it would count the number of binding events. This is how it really it should do it if we were doing maximum likelihood. So the way an E. coli signals, and the way most receptors signal, is that the signal, whenever it's bound, it will signal, right? So this would mean a signal is being generated in the cell whenever it's bound. But really, what it should be doing is counting how many times it got bound. So what should, should, we should be, really be doing is, for instance, instead signaling a completely constant amount each time. And what's important is that it's constant, right? So this, is, this will be the signaling the way it does it, but If it were to do maximum likelihood, then it would signal a fixed amount each, each for each binding event, instead of signaling an amount that depends on the, on the bound time. So E. coli doesn't do that. But there's another important example in which it does that, and it's in vision. This is what I'm going to talk to you about next. And uh, there are other things to say about this, but for, I think for today, maybe I'll just stick to that. So let me just give you a bit of uh, biological facts about, about the human eye, I mean, about vision in general. So the way vision works, essentially, is that it's, it's uh, through the retina. The retina is just a piece of the brain. We, we'll, we'll come back to that later. And you, you can view it as some sort of an array of photoreceptors, OK? So the light comes through the, the pupil, then it goes through the, it's, it's fo focalized by the lens onto a given point on the retina. And then it will activate some photoreceptors, which will generate an electric, electrical current. These are really uh, neural cells. And this electrical current will be then transferred to other types. Sorry, the photoreceptors are actually on the, on the back of the, of the eye. Uh, there are three types of photoreceptors the road, uh, four types, the, the roads, roads, and then three types of cones. And then it's photoreceptors which transmit the electrical currents to uh, an intermediate layer of cells, which, and then to ganglion cells, which the ganglion cells are neural cells whose axons uh, make up the optic nerve. Right? So basically, what, whatever comes out of the ganglion cells will go into the, optical, uh, the optic nerve. And then the optic nerve is like a big bundle of cable. And it goes, it's sent, it's sent to the back of your brain where you have a visual cortex where there's it's, it, it's later processing. Uh, it's important to know that it's actually a lot of, this is really a neural network, and a lot of processing already happens at that level. But it's, it's already interesting to see what happens in even uh, at the level of photoreceptors. Yeah, so this is a blow up 
you see the roads and the cones. Then you see this intermediate layer of bipolar cells, and then the ganglion cells. All right, this is just for the fun of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of weird if you think about it. The light comes here, and then it hits the photoreceptors, which sit, sit at the back of the retina. And it's only made possible by the fact that all these cells here are transparent. If you think about it, it's really a dumb way of doing things because, well, first of all, you have to make everything transparent. But then on top of that, then all these cells have these uh, axons that make the optic nerve. And where there's the optic nerve, then you cannot have uh, photoreceptors, right? So maybe you know this. There's a point in your, in your vision where you don't see anything. This is exactly this point. And you think you see something because your brain reconstitutes in a Bayesian way uh, what should have been there, right? Anyway, so what's funny is that not all eyes, this is basically a flow of design. Like the octopus eye is designed in the right way with the photoreceptors in the front. And then, you know, you have photoreceptors along the entire surface. And then the optic nerve is here. It's, you see it doesn't get in the way of photoreceptors. There's another design of eye, which is the fly compound eye. I'm mentioning it because I'm going to also show, show some data from the, from the fly retina. This is very different design because here you, you basically have uh, one lens. So in our retina, we have one lens that fo focuses light in different directions to different photoreceptors. But you just have one lens, right? Uh, the fly has one lens per photoreceptor. So it's, it's, you could think it's not very smart, but uh, this is the way it works. OK. So the, the thing about the first thing you can ask yourself, and it's a bit in the line of, uh, of what I talked about about Burke and Purcell, which is what's the best possible performance you can achieve, right? And, and here we have to do with how many, to, you know, if I, if I try to see in a very dark room and ask myself what's the smallest amount of light I can detect, okay? So people have been asking the, themselves this question. Psychophysicists try to answer this question by, by uh, designing experiments in which they put some, you know, some people in the dark and they put very dim flashes and ask them, did you see something or did you not see something? Right? So this is an experiment from the 40s. Uh, and there were several people doing similar kinds of experiments. And uh, I don't want to go into the details too much, but they, they put these people in dark rooms and they asked them when they saw a flash, right? And the conclusion they came to, in a quite indirect way, is that all subjects could detect uh, dim flashes of light that had as few as six photons, right? So they, So, of course, you know, you, the, the photons go through your lens, then some of them might be lost, then they go through the photoreceptor, there are some of them might be lost as well. But once they hit the retina, then almost all of them will be detected. And people can actually, can actually detect as few as a few photons, right? So we're very close to the single photon limit. It's quite impressive if you think about it. Uh, and to see why it's impressive, you can look also into more precisely what happens at the level of photoreceptors. So here I'm showing um, some experiments that were done, I think, in, in toads, where they isolated photoreceptors. This is the, the small, it's actually rods. So rods are the photoreceptors that are responsible for night vision. So they're really the ones that you want to care about when you talk about uh, uh, ability to see very, very few photons, right? So they took these rods. And they put them in a pipette, and they, that way they could actually measure the current that comes out of these rods, right? And then what they do is that they, sub they subject in the experiment these rods, which are still alive and still, still functioning cells, to very s dim flashes of light, okay? So here in this experiment, you can see each tick here corresponds to a very dim flash of light. <coughs> 
And what you can see here is that sometimes you see a response, you see a meaning a, a small current, and sometimes you don't. You can forget about this one. And what's really remarkable is that if you, if you plot out the distribution of intensities you see come out of these cells, so okay, so these are, these are uh, forget about this one, this is, this is like a, a response to, a, to a, one of these dim flashes. There's sometimes nothing, you know, a lot of the time nothing happens, and then every once in a while you get maybe a, a response, and, and sometimes you also get a larger response. And so if you take the peak of these responses and you draw a histogram of it, you get a, a, a curve like this. These are the experimental points here are in are the, the circles. And you can clearly see the single photons because you can see a peak here at zero, which corresponds to probably no photons has been absorbed. And here you can see the response to a single photon. And here the response to two photons, and so on and so forth. So you can really separate these peaks, which means that you really delineate single photons. Right, that's the important point. But it, it goes even a bit further than that. It's like when you put these very dim flashes that are generated by laser, what you actually know is that the distribution of the number of photons that should impinge the, the photoreceptor should be a Poisson distributed, right? So if n is the number of photons, P of n should be something like this, right? And what this means is that the height of these peaks, or let's say rather, you know, the area under each of these peaks, should, if I if I look at them, they should actually correspond to this Poisson distribution, and it turns out to be the case, right? So you, you can you can fit this curve with a Poisson distribution, which you have to smooth because you, there's some noise in the response, right? So that's what one first line of evidence that if you look at these single photoreceptors, they can really count neuron, they can really count photons one by one. There's another series of experiments uh, in the same in the in fly photoreceptors this time. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but the, the the experiments showed that it's not just single photons; is that these cells, you can show that the, the, the accuracy with which they respond is such that uh, they can really count up to 1,000, right? So meaning that up to 1,000, the estimates you can make from looking at the response in the number of photons that impinge the cell, the error you will make is of the same order of magnitude as square root of the, uh, of the total number, right? So not to, to go into detail of what this means, but uh, essentially, these, these cells can count up to 1,000. So it, it's quite remarkable that it can really s uh, count single photons from, you know, so on such a, a large dynamic range. So why is that a bit surprising? To, to know why it's a bit surprising, you, you need to know a bit more about how the... So because here I told you, okay, there are single photons that are being absorbed by the, by the photoreceptor, and then I showed you the response, which is the, the, the current that goes out, okay? And maybe I need to tell you a little bit about how you go from the photons to the current. And, uh, yeah, maybe I have to turn the... So this is your retina again, sorry. So the way photons are absorbed is they're absorbed by a, um, a big molecule, which is called rhodopsin, which sits here in the photoreceptors, and they're arrayed in, in some uh, bilayer uh, lipid membranes. So you have many, many, many copies of these different cells, of these different uh, molecules sitting in the photoreceptors. And what happens to them is that when a, a photon hits them, they will change conformation. Right? It, it, it's just a, a, a chemical reaction that provokes uh, isomerization of, uh, of a, a, a small group of this big molecule. Right? So it, it would just change conformation. It just change state. It's called isomerization because it's, it's just a cyst that goes into a trance 
chemically. And then what happens is the following, is that the rhodopsin, in the beginning, was sitting there doing nothing. And then there's a photon absorption. The photon absorption will make this rhodopsin change states, which will denote by R H star, right? And once the rhodopsin in this, uh, in this uh, star state, it changes its cata catalytic activity. So it can become an enzyme that can catalyze other reactions. OK? So it's become active, if you like. And once it's active, it will, it's, so it will catalyze this reaction, which makes another molecule active, which itself can catalyze the, the, the reaction that makes another molecule active, which itself uh, will degrade the product of, of some molecule that will control the opening of the channels that will create the current, right? So you have this complex signaling cascade. Why do you need a signaling cascade like this? It's because, you know, if you, in, you, want, you, you, you want really, you know, what's really amazing about single sub, uh, photon absorption is that in the beginning, you just have one single event, like one single photon, one single molecule, right? But in cells, you have typically thousands of molecules. So how do you get from one photon to then a macroscopic current flowing through the membrane of the photoreceptor? Well, you need to multiply the signal, right? And this is a, this is a signal multiplication scheme. So here it activates. Then this guy will activate a few of these molecules, which itself will activate a few of these molecules. So each time you get a multiplicative effect, right? And each of these guys will degrade a few, uh, you know, a few of these molecules. Each of these steps here can, can give you a 10 to a 1,000 fold uh, multiplication factor, right? So that at the end, you get thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of uh, channels, of ion channels that will open, and, and that will open to let the, the, the ion currents flow, right? So you, you need this photomultiplicative effect, right? In fact, in a, in a CCD camera, you also have a photomultiplicative effect. It doesn't work. Uh, it, it works with electrons instead of working with molecules, but it's the same idea, right? So you have this multi photomultiplicative effect. However, there's still a problem with this if you want to be able to detect single photons. And the reason is the following, is that you see the link with this. Once it starts getting activated, it gets activated, and then just because of you know, relaxation, it gets inactivated in a, in a state of higher energy, and at some point it will relax back to the ground state, right, which is this one. So the photon allows it to be kicked up into a, a configuration of high energy where it's active, but then at some random time, it will go back to this state, right? Actually, it will not go back to this state, it will go back to a state where it has to be recycled. But the bottom line is that the time it will remain active is stochastic because the, the the reaction that makes it inactive is a random reaction. It's a Poisson process. So the time it will remain active is stochastic. So it's exactly what, the same as what happens here, where the time it would remain bound is stochastic. But you don't want that because if it's so, in fact, it would be in the simplest approximation, the the time R H is active, is distributed exponentially, right? So there's some rate. So, you know, a rate of, uh, let me simplify this thing. A rate k of becoming inactive. The probability distribution of the time it stays active is equal to this, right? That's just an exponentially distributed time. So of course, the average time it will remain active. So it's just, well, you know the answer. It's 1 over k, right? This would be the average effect of each photon absorption at the end, you know, it would be multiplied, but at the end of the day, you expect something like this. It will be proportional to the time it remains active. But now, if you want really to be able to be reproducible, you also need to control 
the fluctuations of this, right? If you want to be able to detect single photons or to be able to count photons, you also need to have some control over, over this time, right? Because the idea here is that the response, sorry, is proportional to this time t that will remain active. The longer it stays active, the more it can catalyze this guy and the more it will create our, our output products. So the variation in the response So sorry, the, the variation in delta t will also give you an indication of what fluctuations you expect in the response. So in this simple model where the rhodopsin simply deactivates, you know what the actually what the the variance of something like this is. It's one over k squared. The point is that it's equal to t squared. So if you look at delta t over t, it's all the, you know, on average, so on average meaning, you know, I take it to square root and stuff. Right? This is, this is the same as, a, as what we had before. It's like when you have something that's exponentially distributed, the variations you have over it are of the order of one. And the point is that this, since the response is proportional to that, This will also be of order one. Actually, it has to be larger than one because then, you know, there could be more variations as you go down this uh, signaling cascade. So there could be more noise added to this. But if you have fluctuations in the response that are of the order of one, it's like a hundred percent error, right? So you're not going to be able to, to detect single photons. And in fact, when you do the experiment, and this is a bit, this is another way of redrawing what I already showed you, which was this. You look the p corresponding to single photons; it's very well resolved, right? The variations are, are small. You can quantify this and show that the variations. relative variations in the response, so as measured by the output current, are of the order of 25%. Okay, so, so the, the, there's a bit of a contradiction in what I just said, right? So I assumed, if I assume a model like this, where the things deactivate spontaneously like this, then I must have variations in the time of activation of, of 100%, of the order of 100%. And because this really is what determines then the entire signaling cascade, I must have variations in the response which are also of the order of 100%. And yet, when I do the experiments, I find 25%, right? So what's going on? And we'll see, uh, we see the answer uh, next week. But essentially, you can, you can think of it in, in the light of the, the, the argument I made about maximum likelihood. It's the same thing. Here you really want to have a fixed response for each photon event. But when you have a system like this where things degrade you know, spontaneously with like a Poisson process, you're not going to get that. You're going to get exponentially distributed uh, responses. Right? And what the retina has developed is a way to implement this. 
essentially. So we see uh, next week how it does that. And uh, then next week, uh, I also, after presenting this and then something else about, um, about the early stages of retina, I'll be moving on to, to, uh, to something else. Where I'll be moving on to uh, uh, learning in, in more general settings. And in particular, I'll be talking about maximum entropy uh, modeling and how to use that to uh, model biological data. And one example that I'll give is actually in the retina, so that you, you'll be uh, in a known territory. Okay, uh, enjoy your weekend. <laughs>